Goals. I want to welcome everybody to Ready, Set, Goal, 90 Minutes to Smart Goals for Unity and Word Power. My name is Courtney Maples. I'm a training and implementation specialist with PRC Saltillo. I am, prior to being training and implementation specialist, I was a consultant with PRC Saltillo. I worked in the Georgia territory, and I also am an SLP by trade. I've been an SLP for 14 years, working in a variety of settings from acute care to schools to private practice, vocational training programs, uh, and everywhere in between, it feels like. <laughs> and AAC has always been my passion in all those settings. I did just want to also make you aware of, uh, I am joined this afternoon or evening by my colleague, Beth Wade Lefebvre. She's going to be moderating the chat window for me, helping make sure I don't miss any of your questions uh, or comments that come into the chat window. So let's jump into our training because we have a lot of material to cover. Uh, you can see the learning objectives for today are all really focused around writing really, really good goals. That's just a big overarching goal. So we're going to break it down into several areas, um, and we hope that you get a lot of useful information out of today. All right, last little housekeeping slide here, and this is just my disclosures. Since we are offering this course for ASHA credit, I do need to let you know that we are focusing exclusively on PRC Sotillo products and applications, and we're not going to include information about any other similar products or related applications. Um, Disclosures, I am a PRC Saltillo employee, an employee owner of the company, and I receive a salary compensation. Non-financially, I am a member of ASHA and the Special Interest Group 12, which is for Amendative and Alternative Communication, and I am a member of USAC. Oh, all right, got through all those. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off now so that we can focus in on the slides. And let's get to the good stuff, the, the meat of why we're here. So we always like to start our trainings with a why. Why did we create this training? Why are we learning about this? Why are we focusing on this? And our consultants hear a lot of, hear these questions, particularly these three questions, pretty frequently. Where should I start? Um, what do I work on next? What does an AAC goal look like? or even how do I know what to work on? So the goal of our training here is uh, we want to give you all the resources and ideas and somewhere to start. We really wanna provide you with a framework for thinking about goals. And we just wanna take in a minute to acknowledge that AAC goal writing is often, is, is often something that we hear people say is very difficult. Um, specifically when it comes to AAC goals, you know, a lot of, uh, all of, many of us, I'm, I'm sure are SLPs, um, and we took courses and got a lot of training on how to write a goal, but for some reason, writing those AAC goals just feels so much more difficult. And why is that? And it, it's a multifaceted answer. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of things that, hey. that. There is somebody I keep that, um, if you could make sure that you are muted, you keep kind of popping in a little bit. Um, and I think it's somebody asking a question. <laughs> so if everybody could just make sure they're muted. Um, okay, so getting back to why is it so difficult for us to write AAC goals and objectives? And maybe the first thing, uh, the reason is that we don't know enough about AAC. That's always um, very possible. You could be a new to AAC SLP, and so you just don't know enough. We're glad you're here, and we hope you get that information. It could also be that um, we know that language learning is different for people who use AAC. We know it's not that it's often not a linear process, right? And it can be influenced by a variety of factors. The AAC system. Uh, language experience of the individual. Uh, so because it doesn't, our goal is to follow typical language development, but because there can be sometimes splinter skills or um, 
language uh, areas and skills that are are different, uh, that makes it difficult sometimes to write to my AC goals. There are also a ton of things to work on. Uh, you might just be overwhelmed by the number, the sheer number, the variety of different things you need to work on when it comes to ABC. And how do you determine what is most important? Maybe going to our next point here that it's you're having trouble writing goals because it's hard to measure progress sometimes with AAC learners. Um, and, and this is true of other clients that we have as well, where sometimes the progress that we see and the change is so subtle that it's difficult to represent that progress in a goal. Um, and this is especially true for our individuals using AAC and individuals with complex communication needs. It's hard to chart um, what the progress and what the goal is using our traditional goals and those formal assessments. They don't often detect that small change. Um, and we also need to consider the environment and the partners. Uh, they cannot, those two factors cannot be overlooked. And how do we incorporate, incorporate those factors into our goals? Now, in the training today, we likely are not going to be able to go over all the factors and provide all the answers, but we do hope to give you enough tools and information to get started um, and really help get you on your way to figuring out these answers for yourself. So on the agenda today, over the next 90 minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to start out going over our framework. Uh, we're going to show you our AAC goal writing framework and give you the background to understand it in all its parts. Then we're going to put it into practice, writing a couple goals together. We're going to use one case study as an example and kind of walk you through writing the goals collaboratively for this person. Um, and we'll go through each communicative competency and discuss some baseline information for that as well. And lastly, we're going to make sure that our goals are smart. Now, most of you SLPs or other professionals who write goals for a living probably know that SMART is an acronym, but we're gonna go more in depth for what as, as to what SMART is um, and make sure that our AAC goals are meeting those criteria. So as we go through the, the training today and all the information, I want you to just take a moment now and think about what is your greatest challenge with writing goals for AAC. Uh, it could be one of those things, one of those areas that we've identified previously, you know, those five topics, the environment and communication partners or the language differences, uh, whatever it is. Think about what your challenge is at the moment um, and keep that in the forefront, uh, because hopefully after today's training, you'll come away with some resources and materials to help you tackle that head on. So just think about it for a second. Okay, hopefully you've got your, your challenge in mind and what you really want to accomplish today. Um, this is just a great slide because I, I think it's really important for us to remember that as we get started writing goals, uh, we really, really do need to consider the individual. Um, goal writing is is difficult, was difficult for many of us to learn, and there's so many variables and factors, uh, and it's sometimes tempting for us to really get into a pattern or create a bank of goals or a certain formula that we can apply. With AAC, that doesn't really seem to work because there's so many variables, as we've said, um, to their uh, abilities and their practice and, and creating goals that are important for them. And one of the things that uh, was really a, a big eye opener for me after a few years was realizing that I really had to think about what they wanted, what they wanted to communicate. It might not have always been what I thought was best or what I wanted them to say, but that's really the crux of AAC goals is really remembering that we are empowering them and giving them their voice. And so including their uh, desires and goals in the goal writing process is extremely important. 
All right. We're going to use a little analogy here to help us go through our framework and help us make sense of uh, goal writing for ADC. So in our framework, we are going to think about our framework as a GPS system. Um, I love this image. It just brings up all those memories of those old school GPS, Tom Toms, Garmin's, right, that we used to have to sit on our dashboards of our car. Um, but if we think about our goal framework as a GPS, it, it's very similar. A GPS, in a GPS, in order to make it work, we need to know a, a few pieces of information. One of the things we need to know right off the bat is our destination, right? Where do we want to get to? What is our goal? So that's kind of how I, we're, our framework is, is a good analogy here. We've got our goal. What do we want our AAC user to accomplish? But we also need to know in order to make a GPS work where we are, right? What is our baseline? Where are we starting from? And that's going to be the information we need in order to get to our goal. So we need to know where we want to go and where we are now. And we can um, set the route, right? to get to those goals. So think about it that way as we go through. Um, and those directions and the route that we're taking really become our treatment plan as we go through our AAC goal framework. Now, just a, a quick caveat and just to make sure we're all on the same page here, I'm gonna be using the word goal as we go through the class, the training today. You might be using different terminology depending on what your location or your work setting calls it, a benchmark, an objective. Uh, we're all still talking, essentially, we're talking about the same thing. So don't don't get lost, please, in, in the details and the technicalities and the slight differences. Um, we can really apply all this information to any kind of, of goal or terminology, right? So I'm just, just for clarity's sake, I'm going to be calling everything a goal. <laughs> Now, getting into the framework. The framework was created by a couple of our, uh, both two employees of PRC Saltillo. At the time, they were both consultants in the Midwest, and they used uh, a lot of different information to create this a goal framework. Um, so they were kind of reviewing AAC literature, goal writing literature. They pulled from personal experience and, and their clients and customers, you know, interacting with their SLPs and teams um, and really came up with three important frameworks that they used to create the AAC goal workshop uh, worksheet. Excuse me. And these include the goal attainment scaling system, the communicative competencies, and the smart terminology. And so they kind of put all of these things into this funnel and they, you know, uh, worked it out and it became the AAC goal framework that you have available to you in the handout packet um, in uh, AAC learning journey. And, and your email, you should have gotten a link as well to the handouts. So you can see, and we're gonna go through each of these sections more in depth. Um, that all three of those elements ended up on this framework sheet and you use them all together to make sure that the goals you're writing for AAC uh, clients are um, effective and, and are really what you want to be honing in on. So we'll, we'll briefly kind of talk about each of these sections. So starting with the communicative competencies. If you're not familiar with this work, this is work from Dr. Janice Light. It's been around for uh, since 18, 19, 18, ooh, 1989, excuse me. <laughs> um, and it really um, highlights that there are four areas in which AAC, individuals who use AAC must develop skills in order to become what she deemed at the time, you know, uh, relevant and dynamic uh, and interpersonal and functional communicators, you know, so you have to develop skills in all of these areas to effectively and efficient, efficiently communicate. Um, and so those four areas are linguistic competency, operational, strategic, and social. Um, 
We'll go more in depth about these, but just as a quick overview, the linguistic competency is the ability to use and understand language. Operational competency, it refers to the technical skills that are required to use an AAC system. The social competency is the ability to use and understand rules of interaction. And the strategic competency relates to the compensatory strategies that AAC learners use to um, overcome obstacles and prevent and repair communication breakdowns. So if you have sufficient language skills, you know how to use the AAC system, you have strategies to use when things don't work, and you understand the rules of interaction, you are well on your way to being a competent communicator. Um, so therefore, when we are writing goals, it's really important to consider each of these areas for your client um, and identify those areas of weakness or skills that need to be taught and improved. Next is the goal attainment scaling or the goal attainment scale. Um, now this tool will help you define and organize the path or the those directions, the route you're gonna take. It was originally developed by Kira Sook and, and Sherman um, and it was a way to measure behavioral change in the mental health field. It has since, and this was back in the 1960s, the late 1960s, it has since grown uh, in popularity in other fields, including geriatric populations, early intervention, uh, OTs use it, and more recently in the last decade and a half-ish, uh, it's become more popular and, and more frequently used in speech and language therapy. But it's really a way to measure progress towards behavioral goals and objectives where the outcome criteria using, you know, a number of trials or percentages do not really or do not clearly capture progress. So it helps measure and compare progress across goals. And it, that this really hits to that point we were talking about where sometimes subtle change is difficult to measure. Goal attainment scaling really helps us capture that uh, more closely and be able to talk about the changes and progress we're seeing. So with the goal attainment scaling, we have several layers, several levels. Um, so you have level one as your baseline. That's our starting point, okay? Um, and we're going, we, we always need to know where we are starting from, as we said. Um, and then level three is gonna be our expected destination. Okay, so where we are given our timeline and the setting that we're working in, where do we hope to get to? And level five is our long-term hope. You know, uh, what would be the best possible outcome? Now, as a note, uh, long-term or best possible outcome doesn't always mean 100% accuracy, right? There's very few situations um, in which this would be an appropriate level of performance, you know, I, there are a few, right? When it comes to safety, crossing the street safely, we always want people to cross the street safely. But um, for most of our goals and things that we're writing, 100% accuracy is not something that we're looking for. That's not the ultimate goal. Um, so really, when we're thinking about what our goal attainment scaling is, we need to know where are we today? Where do we want to be in the future? And how are we going to get there? Okay, so the value of the goal attainment scale is really, um, especially for SLPs and practitioners in AEC, is that it measures that client progress in functional situations and communicative exchanges that can't otherwise be measured by percentages and trials, right? That was what we were talking about before. We were not always going to get with AAC learners eight out of 10, that's not gonna be our goal. It would be very difficult to show progress for a lot of, uh, for, for many of those learners. Um, and so one of the things that stood out to the team using this, and, and the reason it's included here, using the goal attainment scale is that um, 
the rubric format is not an all or nothing setup. Okay, so it challenges us to write goals or it challenges the goal writer to consider each level and how progress for each skill is best tiered. So it's really changing the way we're thinking about goals um, so that we can see the change and we can see the, the progress. Um, All right, and the last area that we wanna focus on is making sure that our goals are smart. Uh, now for SLPs, you probably know what this means. If you're a parent, I do see there's a couple of parents in the audience today. SMART stands for goals that are specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time bound. Uh, now this SMART check was pres was purposefully positioned at the bottom of the form um, as the initial focus on, on creating our goals is really getting the content of the goal, right? What is it, we're, where do we wanna be? Where are we now? And how are we gonna get there? So the SMART then helps us fine tune our writing to make sure that we have really all of the necessary components to make sure that our goals are going to be uh, good quality and achievable and, you know, like we said, realistic. So, um, and this, this SMART framework is, you know, something that we use for all of our goals, really, when we're writing goals. So those are the three parts that make up our framework. Now you know a little bit about it, how it was created, and we're going to walk through creating a couple goals. But before we do that, we're gonna use our case study for the day um, and we're gonna be using Matthew to uh, write some goals for Matthew. So I wanna introduce you to Matthew. Matthew is a six-year-old boy with autism. He uses a NovaChat 8 with WordPower 60 Basic. He has just received his device about two months ago. He really benefits at this point in time from continual aided language input. He really does well with uh, gestural prompts. So when somebody points to something or points to his device, he also um, really is um, has some preferred activities that really engage him and are motivating for him. Matthew's fine motor skills, his vision and his hearing are within normal limits. They're not concerns at this time, uh, but he doesn't like loud noises. That is one of the things um, that can cause some behavioral reactions. Loud noises are an antecedent um, for him, for some uh, for behaviors. Let's see, he has about 20 signs and 10 words that he uses to communicate right now. Um, his receptive language skills are below the average range, but he does follow multi-step directions with reinforcement. Um, and yeah, expressively, as we said, he has 20 signs and about 10 word approximations. So that is Matthew. What I, that was a, the clinical view of Matthew, <laughs> but this is the really important stuff to know about Matthew. Uh, is what motivates him, right? That's going back to the, our beginning of our training where we said we really have to make sure the goals that we're writing uh, for our AAC users, give them that voice and really are what they want to be talking about and communicating for. So for Matthew, he likes playing on his iPad. He loves eating snacks, uh, swinging on his therapy swing. He really enjoys wagon rides and Disney music. Um, he does engage in some simple turn play, turn taking activities and parallel play with his peers, like when he's playing with balls or blocks or Simon says or puzzles uh, or even read alongs. So these are the things that really get Matthew. So what do we want Matthew? Uh, what do we want him to work on? Um, and then you can see in this table here, we've written goals and objectives for each of those areas of communicative competency to ensure that his therapy and his intervention is going to cover all the skills that are going to make Matthew a more competent communicator over time. So what we're going to show you now 
is how we got to these goals, why we selected each of these targets, and how we used the AAC goal framework to complete uh, the chart and, and to get to these goals. Okay, and we're gonna finish with that SMART check. So let's start with linguistics. Oh, let me just make sure, okay, perfect. So the ability um, to use and understand language is that linguistic competency, okay? Um, this could in, uh, include all areas of that language, right? Um, so understanding uh, language, using language, it's really that broad overview. For Matthew's goals, his linguistic goals, as you can see in the in the slide here, are to increase the use of prepositions and increase his ability to state his likes and dislikes. Now, the reason these goals um, were chosen for Matthew is that we, um, oops, sorry. So how did, so is it, let's go through explaining how we got to these goals. So we use those tools that were available to us um, to really hone in on, and what we knew about Matthew to really hone in on using prepositions and stating his likes and dislikes. And there's quite a few tools. So we wanna make sure that you are aware of them. Um, if you uh, want to, in the chat window, what is one tool you use to determine typical language development and guide your language goals when you're writing um, goals for your clients? Before I tell you, <laughs> or, oh, we have an app left, we might have, we have time. What, what are some tools if we want to chat them out in the chat window? Language sampling, that's always a great one, Kristen. Communication matrix, tables, okay. All good ones. Functional communication profile. Awesome, communication matrix. So the ones that we used were um, were a little bit different. Don't see anybody saying the ones that we've done. Grade level screeners, bag two. We've got functional communication profile, communication matrix. Yeah, we used um, just some of the other things that we, some of the tools that are combined into the tools that you all mentioned. Um, but yeah, this this is what we used to really hone in on Matthew's goals. Um, and the reason we use this is because we did want to think about typical language development. Um, it's one of the best resources you can use to help you target those areas. Um, and there are, as we have seen, even in the chat, there's lots and lots of great resources out there. One of the most popular ones, though, especially among SLPs, is the Brown's Stages of Language Development and Grammar. It's been used to develop a ton of other uh, frameworks uh, because it includes lots and lots of different areas of language, pragmatics, semantics, morphology, um, syntax. And so um, it's really a great tool to look at those developmental stages and kind of know you know, going from single word productions to multi-word utterances um, and including, you know, all of the other stuff in between, right? As you can see on the slide here, adding past tense markers and that kind of stuff. Um, it's a really useful tool to help us think about, um, this is what a pattern of typical language development would look like. And so I don't have, I can, I can follow along um, at a, to a certain extent, I can follow along to help build vocabulary and syntax and grammar and language, okay? So this is uh, available in your handout or, or links to it as well. Um, you can get the friendly, the user-friendly um, and free version um, from uh, the Lingua Systems, which uh, was a guide called the Communication Milestones. Um, and there's also some links on the ASHA website, which is a website for the uh, speech language pathologists. Um, again, your, these links and things are available in the handout. One of the other things you can use that also follows the Brown's stages of uh, development and grammar is the quad profile. Um, and so this was developed 
uh, with really looking at four, you know, uh, it's four checklists that focus on four major areas of language. One is vocabulary. Another area, as you can see on the slide here, is morphology. Another area it looks at, the third area is syntax. And the fourth is finally function. So the quad profile is also, if I didn't say it, it's a free checklist that you can uh, download and use. And it's just another really handy tool that you can um, use to look at where your AAC learner is in their language development. The other tool that we used, and um, we've mentioned it as it being part of the framework, but it's also a useful tool to really think about um, focusing on um, I'm sorry, not that this is not the last framework. This is uh, also by Janice Light, but this is her work on the functions of communication. Uh, and these are really the reasons why we communicate. And she identified that there are four general purposes or reasons that we communicate. You can see those here on the screen. Uh, we communicate to get our wants and needs met, um, which is really uh, just, you know, requesting objects or assistance or, you know, requesting somebody to stop something. Those are all getting our wants and needs met. We also um, communicate to exchange information. So asking questions, uh, sharing our opinions, um, you know, complaining. Um, those are all things that would be considered, you know, exchanging information. And then finally, we have um, developing social closeness and uh, fulfilling social etiquette. Now you can see in the bottom there that those two um, are the same color. And that is because on the handout that we're going to give you as a resource, we've combined those two. And the reason is um, for that is if you look at the research and you look at uh, what those two areas entail, they overlap a ton. Um, they're almost, they're not the same thing. There is a slight difference in function, but they are so close to each other that for our purposes to simplify things and help us think about the, the various number of reasons that we communicate, we've combined them into one category um, because they, they kind of help do similar things when we're doing these functions. So when we're, um, for social closeness and social etiquette, things like greeting and closings, um, teasing, family members, friends, uh, taking turns, expressing feelings, you know, they, they f depending on the context and the situation, they're fulfilling both categories. So as we said, to simplify, we've put them into one category. Um, and this is just a, a brief overview of all of the reasons that we have for uh, communication. This is on a form in your, your handout, and it can serve as a place to start thinking about all those different functions. Now, it's not an exhaustive list, so if you think of another one that you wanted to address, please don't think that these are the only things that you need to address, but you can see that it, it targets those different areas and the different functions and reasons why we communicate. Um, so, uh, here you have the communicating wants and needs and all the things we've said before. So requesting foods, drinks, toys, um, attention and activities, exchanging information, as we've said, uh, asking that question, sharing and showing objects, even labeling, um, sharing personal information could be a form of exchanging information. And then lastly, that social closeness and etiquette. So making sure that you are developing and maintaining those relationships. Um, another thing, if you are thinking about um, the functions of communication, you can also use the quad profile. It, as I said, there is that one checklist that really focuses on those language functions. Um, and they're divided into seven basic um, types of uh, communication and different seven functions. So you can take a look um, at those and use that, the quad profile as well, to really think about the functions. Okay, the other thing we wanna draw attention to 
is to, as a way to measure linguistic competency, is um, core vocabulary. As you probably know, core vocabulary are those words that make up the majority of what we say, right? Out of the thousands and thousands of words, there's that small group of words, 250 to 400, that make up 80% of what we say. And we know that core allows for us to be flexible and generate novel utterances. We can use it across contexts. It can be combined to increase the semantic and syntactic complexity, right? Following that natural language development. Uh, it allows for the expression of a lot of different communicative reasons or functions. Uh, it, using core also allows us to have consistent locations of vocabulary across pages and our devices. And it highly overlaps very uh, at a high frequency with uh, core or academic vocabulary, excuse me, and literacy in, in early stages. So it's really, really useful. And so we do want to make sure that we are using core as well when we're thinking about our core vocabulary about writing our goals. And there are lots of different core vocabulary lists that are available and resources. Again, in your handout, you have um, a front and back collection of early core words developed by uh, Gail Van Tatenhove. Um, and so feel, and then there's lots of lots of other um, resources that can help you uh, hone in on those um, core vocabulary words. So how did we decide upon these two specific objectives within the linguistic competency for Matthew? Well, we're gonna take a look at um, those resources we had and we're gonna use those resources and we thought about his language. So when we started thinking about Matthew's language, this is what we knew to be true. These were the signs that he could tell us, more please, all done, eat, want, uh, word approximations, he was calling for mom and dad, he was saying no, bye, stop, go. Um, and on his Nova chat, he was saying a lot of those words, uh, same words, go, stop, more, eat, drink, colors, he had five colors. So what we did, um, and we gathered this list using um, like a language sampling kind of uh, method. So um, using parent and teacher report and observation, these were the things that we were able to identify Matthew saying. So then we took that list and we compared it to the core vocabulary list. Um, and we could reflect on what words he did and didn't have uh, and wasn't using currently in his language. Um, so looking at um, the these lists and and this is just kind of that a handout if it's it, it's the list in your handout it's kind of broken down on the slide here um but so this is the study from Mary Banaji and her colleagues about the 23 most frequently used words uh in in toddlers uh and you can see Matthew's got quite a few of these words almost half of them a third of them maybe a, yeah a third of them or so um and then looking at the list further that Gail Van Tatenhove developed, you can see that he's still got quite a few of those first 30 words on that list. And when we're comparing this, these lists of words, what's really missing are these prepositions on both lists. And Matthew wasn't using them on either of those um, of those lists. So we could tell that, you know, they're not currently in his rep repertoire, um, but we could focus on these words and give him the ability to do a lot of things communicatively. He can direct actions and comment uh, and lots of other things if we focus and write goals for these words. So once we, um, once we had some of the words that we wanted to focus on, we also wanted to focus in on um, what we know that he does communicate. And so looking at the, not only the, the words that he was using and looking at the um, language samples, we, we could tell that he was requesting objects. We, we saw that he's requesting his iPad, eat, drink, and activities that are, you know, um, preferable and stimulable for him. 
Um, and he could even deny. He could say, no, I don't want that. He could protest. So with that in mind, we decided that, you know, we could choose to build on any of those functions or we could introduce a new one. And since the prepositions goal would already be working on the function of, you know, directing actions, we decided that we could build on a new goal. Um, and so this is really the point where you realize there are so many things that you can work on and it might get overwhelming thinking about what do I, you know, what do I decide to work on next? And what I want to encourage you to remember is and to do is not to allow yourself to get or feel overwhelmed. Um, you can go and you can look at all these charts and all these resources um, and, and you can think about that, um, but don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed about picking the right way to go, you know, really work with your team. Now for Matthew, that meant that we went back to the team and really thought about, you know, what is going to be most functional for Matthew. Now his team had expressed concerns that he shut down if he didn't like something. So we decided if that, if we worked on stating his opinion and um, starting at that introductory level of, you know, like and don't like, he can do a lot of things with language like that, you know, self-advocate and communicate a lot of things. So don't get overwhelmed thinking about all this by yourself, really focus in on your team and remember to focus in on that client. Okay. So, yeah, so that was the one that we picked to expand. Once you know what you want to work on, you're ready to brainstorm what that might look like. Okay, so let's do it. So don't worry about trying to write all this down. We're going to go through it step by step. This is in your packet, um, but we're going to go through this. So starting at the very top of our goal, AAC goal framework, we're going to write in Matthew's name. We're going to check linguistic as the uh, skill that we're working on. We're gonna write the goal in this box here, his, his objective, his goal, that we are going to increase his use of prepositions. Okay, so that's what we're gonna put in the box. Uh, you can see on the screen here that, um, you know, based on those uh, core word vocabulary lists um, and, you know, the systems, um, we think that these words would be appropriate to focus in on. And they also happen to be on the homepage of his vocabulary. So, you know, he's using word power 60 basic, which is that vocab pictured at the bottom. So those will allow him really quick access and, you know, maybe even better success. Um, on other systems, they're very quickly accessed too, as you can see in the example um, of unity vocabs at the top. So that's what we're going to focus in on, in, out, on, off, and up, down. Now we're gonna go to level one. We're gonna talk about the baseline information. So using that information that uh, we have discussed, we're gonna describe what he can and can't do now as it relates to core vocabulary or more specifically those prepositions. So we're gonna write in um, that Matthew expresses 18 via sign verbalizations or his speech generating device, 18 core words but he does not express any prepositions, not independently at this point. Next, we go to level three. Now, remember level three is where we hope to get to um, in our given time frame. okay? So based on our, our baseline info and his learning style, what do we hope that we can achieve during the next IEP year if we're in a school setting? Um, or if you're in a private practice in the next six months or in the next year, you're going to pick your time frame. For us in that in that school setting for his IEP, it was that he will use six target prepositions to direct actions during structured play activities with minimal support. Now, we're going to write a step that would be somewhere in between where he is now at his baseline and where he's expected to go, um, level three. And that can really um, vary. So you can see here the hint that um, it just depends on what you wanna focus in on. Do you wanna change the level of support? You know, maybe you start with maximum support um, and you're gonna go to minimal support. Maybe it's the number of target prepositions. Maybe you only introduce two, maybe you introduce three. 
or maybe it's the number of different activities. Um, it's really up to you how you measure that change and what that looks like on level two. So for Matthew, we decided that we were going to focus in on the level of uh, support that we were providing because what we really ultimately decided, you know, thinking back to why we were targeting these words, we thought that these were going to give him a lot of opportunity to communicate. And so we wanted to begin by introducing all of them all the time um, so that he was starting to learn all of them. It was just the level of support that was varying. So our midpoint is going to be that he can use those six target prepositions during activities, structured play, to direct our actions given moderate supports. Now, what if he were to meet that goal? you know, within our IEP year, what would we, we wouldn't just stop, what would we want him to do next? So next we would want him to start using those prepositions in less structured activities, right? Um, and our ultimate goal for him over time, we stop and think about it, is that um, we, we, we would want him to use them spontaneously when appropriate. Now, you'll notice that we're not necessarily filling this out in a linear way. It does make sense to start with your baseline and then determine your goal for your period of time. But in some cases, after determining your baseline, it might make sense to you know jump to level five and determining, um, or, or excuse me, and sometimes uh, after determining your baseline, it might make sense to jump to level five. Like what is your ultimate goal? before you do go to level three. So go on the order that best flows with your thought process um, and what best works for you. So for Matthew, it's gonna to be to use those six target prepositions spontaneously when appropriate. And ta-da, there we have Matthew's uh, one complete goal, okay? Um, so with benchmarks for a functional skill that relates to his linguistic abilities, okay? Um, now, if you're feeling overwhelmed at all, the areas that you really need um, to create those goals are your objective, your baseline, and level three. Once you have those three things, you're going to be able to fill in all your other levels by adding or changing certain things, right? Like we've talked about the level of support, the number of opportunities or trials, the number of communication partners. Um, the number of environments that they're using these words in. You could do percentage or frequency. Uh, you could do duration, latency, speed, lots and lots of different things and ways that we can change the goal and the environment and, and write those goals. So remember, baseline, your, your, your goal, your objective, your baseline, and level three. Okay. Now, uh, real quickly, we're not going to go through all of these because we do um, for time purposes, but you can see now uh, we filled in his other goal with being able to increase his ability to state his likes and his dislikes. And his goal, his level three there, is that he'll be able to express his like uh, to indicate satisfaction for 10 known preferred items or activities when asked his opinion. Okay. Um, so that was his goal. We know that his baseline is that he says no when asked, do you want, and plugs his ears or rocks when he doesn't, uh, when he experiences things he doesn't like. So again, knowing that we wanted to work on his ability to state likes and dislikes, knowing what he currently did and what our goal was, um, we were able to fill in that chart. Okay, questions. So some of the questions that we might have um, as we go through is, you know, how do I help ensure Matthew can reach these objectives? Uh, and what will that look like? Um, or you might even be wondering how would these translate into another format? Uh, and we can see here, we'll, we'll target the, the translating it into another format first. That might be one of the easiest ones. Um, and you can see here that it's really, uh, there's an example of our goal framework just translated into the IEP format with our present level of performance being 
um, that baseline, right? That level one. Um, and our objectives um, are end up being our level three. Okay. Uh, and really that uh, top portion where we've identified the linguistic competency really becomes, um, you know, his ability to increase his expressive language skills. Apologies, I forgot that there were animations. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to operational competency. And we're going to target, you know, the next few competencies a little bit differently. We're not going to walk through all of those steps individually, um, since you think you've got the hang of it. Um, but we will look at his goals a little bit more in depth. So operational competency, what is that? The operational competency skills involve skills in the technical operation of AAC strategies and techniques. Um, so um, these are really focusing in on skills um, that require, um, that they require time and uh, to allow the person to be sufficient. They require practice to learn. Um, they can often be de dependent on motivation uh, and strengths and weaknesses. Um, but really, when we think about operational competency, the goal is for the person who uses AEC to be able to operate their system without the burden of any cognitive overlay. In other words, you know, um, despite access method or any other um, operational uh, uh, or any other um, factors, the operational skill of the AEC learner is automatic. We don't want them to have to think about how they turn on their device in order to communicate. We want it to be automatic. Um, and so teaching these skills really help individuals who use AAC become independent and uh, self-advocate uh, and are really, really valuable and we must focus in, okay? Um, so how are you currently aware of your clients or your students' skills as they relate to device use? Do you have any um, resources you're using? Feel free to type those into the chat window. Um, or do you have you written any goals specifically to address operational skills? Or you can chime in on this question. Um, we had somebody asking about identifying concepts, like do you have to understand them receptively before you would write a goal? Um, and so my comment to that was you could write a goal that like if you're talking about a preposition that they follow directions with the preposition, but then you could write a goal, they would state the location of where something is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that does seem to, that follows, you know, what we talk about with typical language development, right? That we often understand things before we can express them often, right? So I, I would agree with that, that um, we would be, if they weren't understanding any of those prepositions, we could be targeting that as well as a receptive language goal. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh, so good. So going back to the operational skills, so we do have, um, let's see, a preference assessment, um, dynamic AAC goals grid, great. And then some people do have um, some operational goals. So to clear the message bar after a certain number of times, yeah, one is um, to place the carrying a strap around his neck to free up his hands, We're clearing the message bar, great. Those are great examples. Um, yeah, and what I did notice is that there's not, so unlike our last area of competence, that linguistic competence, there's not a ton of resources available for operational goals when we think about all those things. Um, there aren't really a ton of checklists or assessments that we can focus on, um, on their, uh, operational skills. Um, sorry, I was following the chat window. Um, and yeah, just lots of good comments there that, you know, making, making, being careful that we don't learn that, that you as operational, having that clear button is not part of the motor plan that sometimes we say a word and then we automatically clear, you know, it's, 
it's a, a fine line. Good point, Beth. Thank you. Um, so what we have created in, and this is available in your handout. Again, this is not an exhaustive list of all the operational skills um, that you could possibly work on. Um, but we did have this little brainstorming tool of some of the different um, areas that are fall under the operational competency that you could target. So let's take a look at the different sections that we have brainstormed. And you can feel free to add to this list if, um, as, you, um, as you work with clients. So the first one is charging the device. Um, you know, lots of, uh, this, these are a few different examples um, of what that might look like. So, you know, for example, charging the device doesn't mean that the person has to physically plug it in, but maybe the, he or she is able to recognize that it's dying and tell somebody, or, um, so they can, um, recognize the signals, right. Or, um, or they can check the status of the battery or they could bring it to a special charging station. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be the one plugging it in, but they are in some way recognizing the battery and the operational component that their device is about to not work anymore and they it's about to not operate and they need to communicate that or get it charged in some way. Um, another one could be to utilize uh, the dynamic display. So this example in WordPower uh, is learning the some of the different buttons and, and how you get to things. So um, if you're on a page, getting back to your home page using that button in that upper left corner, using the lock page on those special pages to stay on a page instead of bouncing back to your home page. Uh, or even going to another page um, that, you know, this could be a, a word power, or if you're using a Unity vocabulary in that activity row, hitting the more button to get more of those options. So these are operational skills as well. Um, we have a few more to take a look at. So using punctuation, especially within word power, um, the, the smart grammar uh, using uh, any of those punctuation marks, periods, question marks, exclamation points uh, will repeat your sentence. Um, and Beth, correct me if I'm wrong, did I see that that's now a thing in some of our other vocabularies as well for like unity? I'm not sure if that's been released yet. I know that's in the works. Okay. <laughs> so maybe it's coming everybody. <laughs> um, Clearing your message from the, the speech display bar, as, as somebody put in the chat window, and we've talked about some of the good and, and bad things on that. Um, and then we talked about that lock page button. All right, um, operational, some of the other operational things would be to customize, being able to learn how to customize your device and add vocabulary. Uh, now again, this is, this is probably, um, uh, later on in your AAC learners stage of development, being able to add their own vocabulary, because as we can see, there's quite a few steps from choosing where to put it, choosing the image, um, you know, that kind of thing, but certainly something to think about and a goal that you might want to achieve over time. Okay. Um, and some of the steps that you could use to get there, you know, to independently putting that device into the new word would be, um, you know, at the very basic level, identifying, you know, when you can't find a word and that they need help finding a word. Uh, once they're able to do that, if they can, um, if the word's not in their vocabulary, they request that it be added to their vocabulary and then eventually being able to add it to the vocabulary themselves. Uh, I saw a couple of other operational uh, goals in the chat window re re related to eye gaze and access. Those are certainly really good uh, operational goals as well. And so um, lots of things to think about there. So we often, you know, focus a lot and significant energy on visual access in the beginning, you know, making sure that we have a mount uh, for a wheelchair or if they're 
They need a high or low contrast visual display. Um, but we also know that we should, uh, we need to focus on more minor adjustments um, to be able to access your device from the lighting in the room or the positioning of the device. Um, uh, a good example of this is, you know, working, I was working with a young boy whose screen display was set to go to sleep after two minutes. Uh, and the teacher never said, uh, the teacher said that he never seems to use his device and always has to be prompted. Um, but during an observation, it was realized that it might be the fact that his device was going to sleep every two minutes and he didn't know how to wake it up. So all it required was an adjustment of how, well, you know, setting that instead of two minutes, having the screen go to sleep after 10 minutes so that he could participate more frequently. Um, and then also obviously focusing on teaching him how to wake his own device up. So those are things that you might need to consider and are important to consider. So waking that device up, um, you know, using the kickstand to adjust the angle if there's a glare. Maybe it's um, instructing your communication partners on you know where to find the device or where to put it or how to move it so that they can more easily access it. So those are some of the minor things. When we think about some of the more major things related to access, there's obviously lots of the major things, right? Direct selection, head tracking, eye tracking, or using switches. Um, but we, whatever our access method is, we want to make sure that we're thinking about, you know, increasing our speed, increasing our accuracy so that we can increase independence. And again, these don't all have to be done all at the same time, uh, but they're just things that we want to make sure that you're thinking about. So some useful um, resources for you, and these are, the links are in your handout. Again, um, Linda Burkhardt's Two Switches to Success is a great handout um, for really looking at switch use. And Jane Corston and her course, Every Moves, Counts, Clicks, and Chats is another great one if you're working with individuals who need alternative access methods um, and you need some more information there. So, anybody have any idea what skills we selected for Matthew? Let's see if you were right. So the ones that we selected um, for Matthew, since there weren't any of those formal assessments or checklists, you know, we kind of went through our brainstorming tool and we highlighted the things that he was doing and made comments about uh, his skill level. So what could he do now? He could, you know, locate the volume uh, within his device. He could navigate to and away from vocabulary pages. He could clear his speech message display bar. He could wake up his device, he could position it and he could get it out and carry it around the environment. But when we really thought about the effectiveness of it, um, of what he was doing, we noticed that some of the things um, like getting his device out and carrying it around were really, it was really an emerging skill. Um, and that waking up his device and turning it on uh, as a whole thing was really a new skill, but it would definitely help increase his effectiveness of communication. So those were the two goals that we picked. So waking his device up and getting it out and carrying it around. And once we knew, used that brainstorming framework, knowing where he was at baseline, what he was and wasn't doing, and what our goal was, we were able to fill out all of the things, all of the levels. So a couple notes about operational skills. Um, they might not always be listed as part of an IEP or even a speech goal, uh, but they should still be part of your device plan. Okay, um, That should be part of that long reaching uh, part of the communicative competence of AEC learners. It should be something that you are working on, even if it's as a soft skill. So again, you might not have a formal goal written for these kinds of skills, but it's definitely important to consider them and make sure that you're focusing on them so you don't wind up with an 18 year old who can write you poetry, but doesn't know how to turn on their book, their, their, their AEC device, excuse me. 
Um, and uh, it's some funding sources do in fact look for operational skills so that, that a person can complete. So making sure that you're really just keeping the goals and your framework well-rounded. Now, let's take a look at the social competency. Social competency skills are highly context dependent, okay? And they have to be evaluated within the context of communication um, because as we know about social skills, it is about connecting with people and it's related to the situation that we're in. Matthew's social goals that we identified were to be able to use greetings to initiate a conversation and ask social questions. So let's think about social, uh, typical social development um, and, and we'll get to how we got to Matthew's goals. So just a, a quick, um, side, sort of a sidetrack here. We're going to talk for a few minutes about social thinking versus social skills. And there's a lot of different definitions of what social skills are, but I think, um, I think of them as the abilities necessary to get along with others and to create and maintain satisfying relationships. So social skills really involve three major communication skills. It's using language for different purposes. It's changing your language to uh, according to the needs of the listener or the person you're communicating with. And it's following the rules for conversation and storytelling. Okay, so like taking turns, introducing a topic, staying on topic, rephrasing when you're not under, uh, misunderstood. And so those three things together really um, highlight what social skills are and how they really uh, focus in and relate to communication. All right, before we share your tools, what are our tools? What tools do you use with your students and clients to determine appropriate social targets? Okay, Kristen says things they're starting to do but don't have language for. That's a good place. So. Yeah, maybe they are uh, using some non-verbal or non-speaking language. We can give them those words in those situations. Parent interview and goals. That's a good one too, Brianna. <laughs> Teachers goals. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all really, really um, great things to to focus uh to use yeah very important um carrie had a good uh comment so keeping in mind neurodiversity affirming type goals rather than traditional social goals that's great mm -hmm. an observation in various environments mm -hmm. um so some of the ones that we want to share with you and some of the ones that we've done is or have used and especially when thinking about Matthew is that um there are a ton of pragmatic language checklists and charts available right we've listed some of them for you in the handout again it's not an exhaustive list um but and nor are they the best ones to use necessarily but these are just some of the ones that um we've used over the years and consultants have used and have familiarity with um and thought that they were worth sharing so a few that we've often heard of is the um, Social Thinking Curriculum by Michelle Garfield Wiener. Um, again, uh, some of these things um, are uh, changing. And so as Carrie mentioned, keeping neurodiversity affirming type goals rather than traditional social goals in mind is super, super important um, and, and trying to balance the two. Um, Lingua Systems also has a uh, communication guide uh, or the guide for their communication milestones has a section on pragmatic language skills. Um, the teacher's rating scale we had on the, that slide there. Um, the pragmatics profile, even the quad profile, as we've mentioned. Um, 
has has a section on on pragmatics. Um, even within our language AAC language lab, there is a pragmatics profile for people who use AAC, um, and that came um, from the ACE Center. Uh, was originally developed by Hazel Dewart and Susie Summers, and has been you know used extensively by SLPs uh, throughout the years from the late '80s. Um, you know, it was originally intended for preschool aged kids, but it's been extended for use with children up to the age of 10. So that can be really a great uh, checklist and thing to start using um, if you're looking for more materials. So what skills did we select for Matthew? So we could choose from any of those number of different pragmatic language checklist that we've just gone over. Um, and, you know, we could highlight where he's currently demonstrating skills, select our skills based on that. Uh, we could also reflect on his interest and his friends. Um, but in this case, as Matthew moves to more functional communication and functional skills, we wanted him to be able to ask and answer questions. So we decided to include using greetings to initiate a conversation as one of his first targets in the area of social competence. Um, we decided that if you know we couple this asking um, with asking social questions, we can encourage conversational turn taking. So we're really getting a lot of um, language and communication and interaction by focusing on having an initiate conversation and then ask questions. So, um, and the good thing about that is that it really highly uh, overlaps with some of the vocabulary. My apologies, my dog is whining in the background, so we can hear that. And my slide appears to be a little bit off. Um, but what we are highlighting here is that the ability to um, use social greetings and words is very easily accessed in a lot of our vocabulary systems um, with one or two button pushes. So being able to say hello, uh, goodbye, um, once you click just that one button. Uh, in word power, we have uh, very similar things as well. Um, after just one or two button pushes, you are able to uh, access those communication words very quickly. Then you have access to say good morning, uh, goodbye, what's up, all of those different things. Okay, just one more example of looking at Unity and that activity row and all the things that you're able to say. Uh, this is looking at our question words, just pushing that one question button. You're able to uh, get a lot of access to a lot of different question words, um, and you're able to communicate those very quickly. Word power is very similar. Um, Word power specifically, and the, the vocabulary that Matthew was using had a social, has a, a personal and social questions page built into it, where a lot of the personal information and then also the accompanying questions you can ask are located on one page. And ta-da, I'll give you a minute to look over that. But again, just looking at the baseline information that we had, and knowing what level we wanted him to go to, we're able to quickly fill in that framework. So knowing that he doesn't, he only uses greetings when he's prompted, but that we wanted him to um, start a conversation at least five times with three indirect verbal prompts. Um, so we knew where we're starting, where we're going, and, and how to get there in our long-term goal. All right. Let's keep going with strategic competency. As we mentioned before, the strategic competency is the use of compensatory strategies to overcome any environmental barriers uh, in society um, and, and any other inherent restrictions of the AAC system. So individuals with complex communication needs will invariably have to confront these limitations in their linguistic, operational, or social competence. Um, 
And so um, because we're using a different type of communication, so because we're using that and there, there are these barriers, we have to develop some coping strategies that allow them to bypass these limitations and, and make the best of uh, what they know and can do. So with Matthew, the two strategies that were targeted were to use introductory statements to explain his device and repeat a message when he was misunderstood. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep going, but if you have any strategies your client or student uses related to their device, type them into the chat window. Let's um, share and get a little bit of our juices flowing. Um, maybe it's something somebody hasn't think, thought of before. Or what other strategies do you um, think might be good for Matthew? You can answer either of those questions. Uh, but what we do have in your handout for you is a brainstorming tool. Again, because there's not a ton of um, formal assessments or checklists that you can use. So it's just a brainstorming tool that's not an exhaustive list of some envir environmental barriers, um, restrictions on the AEC system, those social barriers, um, linguistic barriers, or any operational barriers. So there might be times where you decide to wait to focus on strategic competencies, or there might be times where focusing on strategic competency is the most important. Um, so you really have to, again, keep your client in mind and what is the goal. All right, so some environmental barriers that we might uh, think about uh, would be volume. So using strategies, um, to use your device during a, a la, a during varying environments, right? If you're in a loud environment, knowing how to turn the volume up. If you're in a quiet place, knowing that it doesn't need to be on the loudest volume. Um, um, you, we could also talk about um, strategies to be able to use to talk, to text, right? Or to talk on the phone. Um, or even to use your device outside, whether that's turning the screen uh, brightness all the way down or using some other kind of uh, shield, sun shield. Um, those environmental barriers are things that we are, might, our AEC learners might face and we need to address and give them the strategies to continue participating in their daily lives. Looking at some of the social barriers, um, you might have to teach them specifically how to repeat a message when they're misunderstood or asking a communication partner to slow down or use other strategies that might help the AAC learner um, communicate. They might have to advocate for themselves. I saw in the chat window that introductory message, you know, this is my AAC device, it helps me communicate. That is a, syst is a phrase that is built into WordPower and it's easily addable, <laughs> or you can easily add it to any of the other um, vocabularies that we have. Linguistic barriers. Uh, so when we reviewed the linguistic competencies, there were a lot of different skills. And we know that we can't work on all those skills at once and we would have to prioritize. Um, so that means that there are going to be limitations since they might not have all the required skills. Your, you know, that, so your, your strategy will rely heavily on those specific linguistic limitations when you're focusing on linguistic barriers and strategic uh, compensatory strategies. Um, and uh, yeah, so being able to, some of those things could be like using word prediction, right? So asking um the uh, I'm using that word prediction to to find to find your words or to find where they're located um saving a message or a notebook uh this is couldn't be more pertinent um we just had a comment in the chat window that their uh goal or uh, their focus is having their client uh, use their device when his message is not understood because he has some vocal language, but he's is difficult to understand what he is speaking. And so using his device to repair that communication breakdown or even repair a communication breakdown using your device. Um, there's lots and lots of different things that can be focused on when we're talking about linguistic barriers. Operational barriers. Um, 
in order to obtain communicative competence, we do we we must remember that um, that individuals with complex com communication needs may rely on a variety of strategies to overcome those constraints. Um, so sometimes they might use telegraphic messages to enhance the rate of communication. They might uh, ask partners to guess messages that they're spelling when they're re uh, feeling fatigued or to reduce fatigue. Um, we could use operational or uh, light tech boards when needed um, as a way of always having access to your words, right? If you're um, in the pool or whatnot. Um, using some alternative means uh, or indicating, learning how to indicate that you made a mistake on your device. So for Matthew, uh, we determined, you know, we needed to determine what his restrictions and constraints and the barriers were on him that were impacting him. And in thinking about him and his limited language, we thought that the linguistic constraints might be one appropriate area to consider as a strategy to focus on. Um, and mm -hmm. another area for him that was difficult was social interactions. And we saw that we have targeted that um, before. So we considered, you know, therefore thinking about all these things, we wanted to um, consider some strategies that would facilitate his social interactions. So we can see how all of our goals and really looking at him big picture are kind of coming together. So here are the two possible objectives for Matthew that we came up with, which were to use those introductory statements again, um, to explain his device and repeat his message when he was misunderstood. So here we have um, an example of showing that introductory statement that's currently pre-programmed in the message on Unity by going to me and my device and being able to say, you know, this is my device, this is my name, you know, my talker. Um, same thing in word power. So writing that goal for him. Um, oh, sorry. So the goal for him uh, was the the complete ultimate goal for him was to use that independently. And so here we go, all completely filled out. All right, let's play name that competency before we get to the last part of um, of our training today. So we've got four minutes left. All right, so what I wanna do is I'm gonna give you an example. I want you to write in the chat window, whether it was linguistic, operational, social, or strategic. So use a pre-programmed sentence to repair a communication breakdown. Is that linguistic, operational, strategic, or social? Good, strategic, good job, okay. How about independently navigates through a vocabulary file? Linguistic, operational, strategic, or social? Good, operational, good job, everybody. Increase use of core vocabulary words by uh, 20 words. Your guys are on fire. <laughs> Last one, use six or more communicative functions. Good, social. Actually, I see some people putting linguistic too, and you're absolutely right. It could be both linguistic and social. Good job. All right, now let's talk about fine tuning our goals and objectives. We said at the beginning that this is not, you know, the goal writing workshop and, and that it wasn't, um, and that this was really more of a framework, but we do want you to keep in mind that your goals still need to be written um, to be measurable, but they also need to be in accordance with, it, with whatever your rules and policies are. And very often that also means that they are smart, right? That they are specific or uh, meaning that it's, they're clear in a way that uh, somebody else could easily um, understand what you're working on. We wanna make sure that they're measurable so that we can show progress and know when we've achieved the desired outcome, that they're agreed upon, um, you know, we're there to, uh, so that we're sure to support all the desires of everybody on the team, including the AAC women. The R stands for realistic or relevant, could be either one, um, you know, given the knowledge, time, age, availability of resources, is it realistic? Uh, or is it relevant for both the person today and tomorrow? And that they're time-based. We want to make sure um, that we know how much time we have to work towards it and that it's a manageable goal that we could actually get there. So 
Um, you can, um, you have this smart checklist, the smart guide in your handout, um, but we're going to kind of go through some of our goals that we wrote today and do this final smart check. Now, the first goal we wrote today, Matthew will use six target prepositions during act, dur to direct action during structured play with minimal support is not really, it's not currently a smart goal. Um, and if we go through all of the, the markers, is it specific? We might want to change minimum support uh, because that could vary from person to person. We might need to define what that is. Is it measurable? Yeah, six prepositions. Uh, and we've defined what those were. Is it agreed upon? Yes, we did that earlier. Uh, is it realistic? Maybe we might want to add and uh, that those structured activities maybe be more motivating activities so that we could get we could keep it realistic and relevant. Um, that might make a difference. Um, and is it time bound? So the wording here is not, but we had a date. Um, but had we but we had a date indicated on that goal form. So you could write that into the objective, you know, so by May 2018 or whatever date, he will be, Matthew will use six target prepositions to direct action during motivating structured activities, giving aided language input and an indirect visual cue. So that makes it specific. It makes it time bound, measurable and realistic. All right, so you have in your handout, and then one minute over, if you are an ASHA SLP looking for that CEU credit, you have met the goal, um, so you're free to sign off if you don't have time. Mm -hmm. There is some practice um, goals you can do within your handout there, um, but we hope if we think back to the very beginning in our analogy of um, what our uh, training was today, we hopefully you've gotten some ideas and resources that will help you answer the questions of how do I get where I want my AAC learner to be uh, with all these different uh, things that are available to us. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes and answer them. And otherwise, thank you all so much for being here today. You've been a great interactive um audience and i hope you got a lot of good information